We just got back from a small expedition ship cruise going through the Panama Canal. Hello cruisers and welcome to another Cruise Report Cruise Ship Review. My name is Chris Dickman and along with my girlfriend of almost 30 years now, we've been reviewing cruise ships, destinations, hotels, resorts, and travel products. Now we recently returned from our 145th cruise. This 10-night cruise was aboard Swan Hellenic's newest and largest expedition ship, SH Diana, which, by the way, was our 115th ship that we've reviewed. Now, I should mention that we are not being paid by Swan Hellenic to do this review. No money changed hands, and they have no idea what we're going to say in this review. However, they did invite us on this cruise as journalists to review the ship. Also, we're not travel agents and stand nothing to benefit should you choose to book a Swan Hellenic cruise in the future. Likewise, we suffer no consequences should you choose not to book a Swan Hellenic cruise. I'm basically going to tell you everything we liked about the ship and what might need a little bit of improvement. I'm going to tell you about the itinerary and the overall experience. So with that out of the way, let's get started. This sailing embarked in Punta Arenas, Costa Rica, which is about two hours from the capital city of San Jose. Swan Atlantic offers guests a one-night pre-cruise stay in San Jose at the Hilton Garden Inn. Actually, the hotel was located in Santa Ana, a suburb of San Jose. After our three-hour flight from DFW to San Jose, we were greeted by a local tour operator employed by Swan Hellenic to meet and greet guests at the airport and provide the transfer to the hotel. The person meeting and greeting us was also meeting and greeting for two other tour companies which had guests arriving at the airport about the same time as we did. Now, there were nine of us in the Swan Hellenic group, and we found ourselves standing outside the airport for nearly an hour waiting for two more people to show up. The meet and greeter finally decided to go ahead and send us along to the hotel. So the meet and greet and transfer could have been handled a little more efficiently so that the Swan Hellenic group didn't have to stand around and wait for an hour or so for someone that could have missed their flight or experienced some other delay. Now, it's not a deal killer, but it could have been handled a little better. Turns out that the couple we waited for had already arrived and gone to the hotel on their own. When we finally did get to board the van, the ride to the hotel took about 30 minutes in heavy traffic. We arrived at the Hilton Garden Inn, which, by the way, is a very nice hotel. We found a hospitality desk manned by the same meet-and-greet company. They had a schedule written on a whiteboard of when we had to have our luggage outside the next day for pickup so that they could load it on the bus. Our hotel room was very nice, clean, quiet, very comfortable. So good job Swan Hellenic in picking a good pre-cruise hotel. Breakfast the following morning was included, but dinner the night we arrived was not. Fortunately, the hotel has a full-service restaurant, and it is also located in sort of a, a mini shopping area with other restaurants within easy walking distance. Now, the following day, our bus was scheduled to depart the hotel at 1 p.m., which it did right on time. There were two motor coaches with about 30 guests in each, so the coaches were not overcrowded. Our luggage was loaded onto the bus, and we did not see our luggage again until after we were on board the ship. Se encontraron a pesar de todo, porque la vida lo quiso y así fue. Our 
coach arrived pierside at almost exactly 3 p.m. We have a short video describing our embarkation experience. If you're interested, I'll put a link up in the corner of this video so you can watch that. We embarked on deck four and were escorted to deck seven where we were greeted with a glass of champagne and got into line to complete the check-in process. Now we stood in line for about 10 minutes behind some other guests who were checking in, but once we got to the crew member who was to check us in, we discovered that we had been upgraded from a D5 balcony stateroom to a junior suite. And we can only assume this had something to do with the fact that the ship was little less than half of capacity. We received our stateroom key cards, which are placed on lanyards and headed to our suite. Actually, I went to the suite alone while Ricky went to the reception to deal with another issue. Now, one of the room stewardesses grabbed my backpack and carry-on luggage and escorted me to our junior suite, number 634. The suite is located on deck six aft port side. Overall, the embarkation experience and the transfer to the ship from the hotel was seamless and everything went very smoothly. SH Diana is an expedition ship, and while not the smallest expedition ship on which we have sailed, she is small by cruise ship standards. This is a polar class vessel, meaning that she's designed to spend a lot of time in places like Antarctica, Greenland, the Chilean fjords, and the Arctic. Expedition ships are typically smaller so they can navigate into very small anchorages that the larger ships simply can't get into. SH Diana is the newest and largest ship in the Swan Hellenic fleet. The gross tonnage is 12,255 with a guest capacity of 192 and a crew complement of 127. Now that's an extremely high crew to guest ratio, which typically will translate into better and more personal service. You will never get lost on this ship. There are only two elevators located midship and a single indoor staircase, and those will take you all the way from deck three to deck nine. You're never more than three minutes between any two points on the ship. Let's take a look at the ship deck by deck, starting at the top deck, and we'll work our way down to the lowest deck. Deck nine is called the stargazing deck, and it's the highest point on the ship. On our sailing, there were some sun loungers set up here where you could get as close to the sunshine as possible. Deck 8 is where you'll find the ship's bridge and the spa and salon. There's a nicely equipped fitness center here as well. There's also a co-ed sauna here, and just outside the sauna is a jacuzzi hot tub. Deck 7 is the location of most of the public spaces on board. Forward is the observation lounge, which is where the ship's main bar is located. One section of observation lounge has been carved out to make a card room and a small gift shop. Now farther aft on deck seven is the club lounge, which is used for casual dining. Actually, all of the dining on board is very casual, but if you just want a light breakfast or lunch or a nice place to sit and enjoy a meal from the adjacent pool grill, this is the spot. Now, this is where I would come every morning for coffee and to work on my laptop. And I love the booth seating they have here. Just aft of Club Lounge is the pool bar and grill where they serve burgers, chicken sandwiches, and grilled shrimp skewers each day. There's also a small heated infinity edge pool here and some sun loungers. Deck six forward is where you'll find the iconic Swan's Nest, which is the ultimate outdoor sightseeing deck for spotting whales, dolphins, or just scenery in general. 
that green arch has some sort of symbolic meaning, something to do with Greece. A crew member tried to explain it to me, but it has something to do with the Greek heritage of the original Swan Hellenic cruise line. Now here you'll also notice two large propellers affixed to the decks. And these are actual replacement propellers that, should a propeller become damaged, can be installed on the ship without the ship having to wait for weeks or months for a new propeller to be created and arrive from shipping. I'm not sure that I've ever seen that before. The remainder of Deck 6 is made up of suites and staterooms. Deck 5 is completely made up of balcony suites and staterooms. Deck 4 forward is where you'll find the ocean view staterooms. Midship is the reception desk, which by the way is open 24 hours. And aft, you'll find the Swan Restaurant, which is open for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. And there's also a complimentary guest laundrette on Deck 4. Guests embark and disembark the Zodiacs on Deck 3 through Base Camp. You can think of it sort of like a mudroom for an expedition ship. Every stateroom has its own locker at Base Camp where you can store snorkel gear, life vests, and any other items. You can also refill your water bottle at the base camp water filling station. Now also located on Deck 3 is the medical clinic, the ship's library, and an expedition lab where experiments and tests are conducted dealing with environmental subjects. There were public restrooms on every deck where there are public areas, and they were always spotlessly clean. Cloth hand towels were provided as well as paper towels. However, the signage was a little vague and confusing. I didn't even realize until day three that I had been inadvertently using the ladies' room until one of the cleaning crew pointed it out to me. It was pretty embarrassing. So in a nutshell, that is SH Diana. Now you may have concerns about feeling excessive motion on such a small ship, but honestly, this was one of the smoothest sailings in recent memory. We only felt a small amount of motion one day out of 10. Of course, that's always going to depend on the sea conditions, which will vary from one sailing to the next. Working on a separate video where I'm going to do a complete walkthrough showing most, if not all, of the features of three different stateroom categories on SH Diana. I'll show you the junior suite, similar to the one in which we were occupying, the standard balcony M6, and the accessible balcony stateroom. If you're interested in that video, make sure you click the subscribe button down below. Don't forget to click the notification bell so that you'll be notified when that video comes out. Now in that video, I'm going to give you an overview of our junior suite number 634, which was located aft on deck 6. I was told by our stateroom attendant Eric that each junior suite is different. The layout and configurations can vary from one junior suite to the next. They can also range in size from 344 square feet to 388. And I'm assuming that we received one of the smaller 344 versions. And the reason I'm making that assumption is because when I looked at the other junior suite, I noticed that it was nearly identical to ours, except that it had a much, much larger sofa, maybe twice as long, and a little bit longer desk. SH Diana also has ocean view staterooms, larger suites, and premium suites. And you can find all of the details about these on their website. A nice feature is the sweet doors to the hallway have a very soft and quiet latch so they don't slam shut. Every suite is equipped with a 50-inch flat screen television. However, I did find the programming to be a little lacking. There were some news channels like CNN and Sky News. For some reason, Fox News was listed but unavailable. They had the Food Network, Travel Network, 
and for some reason no longer has anything to do with travel, and a couple of sports channels, mostly European. There was a large selection of on-demand movies, and they were all complimentary. Each suite is also supplied with high-quality binoculars, which you do not get to keep, by the way. A very large and nice waterproof backpack for each guest and a metal refillable Swanolinic branded water bottle to use on excursions. The backpacks and water bottles are yours to keep. Our junior suite number 634 was very quiet and comfortable. We never heard our neighbors. Our suite was located underneath the pool deck and one evening we could hear a lot of chairs and tables being moved around in preparation for a deck party, but otherwise it was very quiet. With only two nights left in the cruise, Ricky tested positive for COVID, so she was quarantined in the suite and they moved me to a standard balcony stateroom M6 right down the hall, number 628. Very nice configuration, but unlike our suite, it was very noisy at night. It was located right next to a crew area and the slamming crew doors could be heard all day and night. So if you're sensitive to noise, I recommend that you avoid booking number 628 or 632 as they both are right next to this crew area. Other than that, we found our junior suite to be extremely comfortable with plenty of storage and packed with luxury amenities. Watch for my walkthrough video for all the details. Our stateroom attendant, Eric, was excellent. He made up our room twice a day, and at evening turndown, he would even spray a mild but very pleasant fragrance in the stateroom. So after dinner, we would return to our suite to find chocolates on the pillow and this amazing fresh scent in the air. I've never seen that before in any other cruise line. I say this on every video, but food is the hardest thing to review and rate since everyone has different tastes, likes, and dislikes. And on this cruise, it was an even more of a challenge as I've been adhering to a carnivore diet where I pretty much only eat meat and protein. I don't think I ate a vegetable during the entire 10-night cruise, so take this with a grain of salt, no pun intended. Guests have a choice for breakfast. You can have a full breakfast buffet in the Swan restaurant, which is the main dining room. You'll find a wide variety of items such as cereals, yogurt, pastries, fresh fruit, cold cuts, cheeses, scrambled eggs, bacon, link sausage, beans, mushrooms, and roasted tomatoes. There is an omelet station where you can get eggs made to order. Okay, being a meat-only carnivore, I plan to load up on bacon. Unfortunately, on most days, the bacon was so tough, I could not even chew it. I've never had tough bacon before, but this was like bacon jerky. The link sausages, on the other hand, were as good as I've ever had anywhere. On my carnivore diet, I can eat eggs. After all, they're pure protein. However, the eggs made to order were sort of hit and miss. I ordered a ham and cheese omelet one day and it seemed a little overcooked, almost burned. I ordered poached eggs that were very undercooked with translucent egg whites and on top of that they were served cold, not lukewarm, but cold. Now Ricky did get one good order of Eggs Benedict on the first morning. But on her second attempt later in the cruise, the eggs were way overcooked and again served cold. So they need to work on their egg station. All of the other items like pastries, cereals, breads, etc. were very good. But eggs and bacon? Man, talk about the basics of breakfast. I will say though that the coffee served in the Swan restaurant is very good and Ricky said that the hot chocolate was some of the best she's ever had. Now, if you're in a hurry or you just don't need a full-on breakfast, 
there is a lighter fare buffet breakfast offered in the club lounge on deck seven. And here you can find a selection of fruits, sliced meats, yogurt, cereals, toast, pastries, mini bagels, donuts, and a self-serve coffee machine, but no hot entrees. A lunch buffet is served every day starting at 12 noon in the Swan Restaurant. There's an extensive salad bar, selection of breads, pastries, and other desserts, as well as a variety of hot dishes that change every day. In addition to buffet items, guests can also order made-to-order burgers. The salads, breads, pastries, and desserts Ricky tried were all good. The hot dishes varied from very good to average and some I'd say even below average. A few of the beef dishes on the buffet were so tough I could barely chew them. Now one day they offered a selection of Indian dishes on the buffet with butter chicken, a mutton curry, and shrimp curry. All of these dishes were excellent. In fact, some of the best butter chicken I've had on any cruise ship. So the galley has the ability to create great dishes with lots of flavor. The issue seems to be a little consistency. Some things are great, others are not so great. One day they had tempura battered fish and chips and Ricky and I both agreed. These were the best fish and chips we've ever had on a cruise. A lighter buffet lunch is served at 12.30 every day at the club lounge and the pool grill on deck seven aft. The buffet here has salads and breads and desserts and a couple of the hot dishes that you'd also find in the Swan restaurant. And you can also order from the pool grill which is located just aft of Club Lounge, and you can dine inside at Club Lounge or outside at the pool grill. They offer burgers, steak sandwiches, a grilled chicken burger, grilled shrimp skewers, a sausage on a bun, not to be confused with a hot dog, some pizza, and grilled fish. Now those inconsistency issues seem to exist with dining at Club Lounge also. On our second day of the cruise, Ricky and I had lunch here. I ordered a cheeseburger with fries and Ricky ordered the open face steak sandwich. Ricky's steak sandwich was so rare and tough she couldn't eat it. My burger would have been good had it not been for a very stale and dry hamburger bun. Fortunately, the french fries were very good. I did not try the shrimp skewers, but they looked very good. Now on our second lunch attempt here, I mean, I wanted to give the cheeseburger another try. It's only fair. This time it arrived with a soft, fresh, slightly toasted bun, and it made all the difference. In fact, I would say it was one of the top three burgers I've ever had on a cruise ship. The meat is very good, not overcooked. The lettuce, tomato, onion were all fresh, and the cheese was good. And on a third visit, I confirmed again, this was not a one-off, it's a good burger. My third cheeseburger was just as good as the second one. A choice of red or white wine is also offered with lunch, and of course, you can order soft drinks or tea or any cocktail. We found the service in both venues at all meals to be very good. I should also mention that breakfast and lunch buffets in both Swan Restaurant and club lounge are self-serve. Dinner service begins at 7 p.m. in the Swan Restaurant, and there is no dinner service in club lounge. On embarkation day, dinner is served buffet style. From that day forward, full table service is offered. Even though the dress code for dinner is very casual, the dining room is staged quite elegantly with white tablecloths linens, and charger plates. Menus do change each evening, and you can choose from a selection of always available items like Caesar salad, steak, pasta, grilled chicken, grilled salmon, and some side items like baked potatoes. The daily menu includes a choice of two appetizers, a soup dish, two salad choices, four entree choices, usually a meat, a pasta, a seafood, and a vegetarian choice. 
At least three different dessert choices are also offered in addition to a cheese plate, fresh fruit, and a choice of ice cream. We found the evening meal service to be consistently good, with none of the missteps found at breakfast or lunch. The menu selections were good. Every dish we had at dinner was good to excellent. In fact, dinner was our favorite meal on SH Diana. I ordered the always available ribeye steak on three different evenings, you know, the carnivore thing, and each one was very good, perfectly cooked, and they did offer a red and white wine each evening at dinner, and the wine choices changed every day. I found the red wines to be very good, and I rarely order white wine. Now, while they did not have a sweet Riesling on board, Ricky did find a Moscato that she enjoyed, and after the first evening, the wine server remembered her preference and always poured her a glass of the Moscato. Service in Swan Restaurant was as good as we've experienced on any cruise. And Renato, the dining room manager, is always roaming around the dining room to make sure everything is perfect. On the last evening, the Swan Restaurant was closed, and they had a special dinner under the stars, which was set up on Deck 7 aft. There was an elaborate buffet feast, including grilled lobster, steak, barbecue ribs, actually too many items to mention in this video. And guests could dine poolside or indoors at the club lounge. This was one of the dining highlights of the cruise. They also have an afternoon tea service every afternoon at 3 p.m. in the club lounge. And this is not a formal high tea, but a buffet that includes sandwiches, cookies, cakes, scones, and some other treats. Se encontraron a pesar de todo porque la vida lo quiso y así fue. All beer, wine, soft drinks, and cocktails are included in your cruise fare, with the exception of some premium wines and liquors that may be at an additional cost. We did not spend any time at the pool, so we never really used the pool bar, but we did visit Observation Lounge each evening. I found myself going to the bar to order our drinks because there would often only be one person working behind the bar. The ship did stock both Crown Royal and Canadian Club, something I have struggled to find on some other cruise ships, so good job. And Ricky seemed very pleased with her lemon drop martinis and vodka tonics. When I ordered Crown or CC, they always poured me a double without me even having to ask. In fact, one evening, the bartender placed an empty glass in front of me and handed me the bottle and said, here, I'll let you do the honors. I've never seen that before. <laughs> I got to pour my own drink. As for canapes, they only brought them around on two or three evenings. One night, they brought a plate of beef jerky. I've never seen that before on a cruise. And honestly, it was pretty good. They did, however, place some snacks at the bar most evenings for those guests sitting at the bar. I suppose I could have asked for one to take back to our table. I just never did. Where they might be able to improve would be to have additional waiters to go through the lounge to take drink orders and deliver the drinks. I don't recall anyone ever asking us if we wanted another drink. We would just walk up to the bar and place our order and they'd make our drink for us. When it comes to activities and entertainment, it's important to remember that this is an expedition ship, not your traditional cruise ship. There's no casino, there are no production shows, no kids programs, or water slides. The main activity comes from the destination itself. 
That could be hiking or spending a day at the beach, exploring nature, snorkeling, etc. We did enjoy a few enrichment lectures from some members of the expedition team as well as a guest lecturer, Ben Clark. He's a scientist who works with SETI, and he had some very interesting lectures on space exploration, NASA, and Mars missions. A briefing is held each evening in the observation lounge where Nikki, our expedition leader, would tell us about the following day's schedule of events. As for entertainment, we did have a duo, Latin Fever, perform for us each evening during cocktail hour and after dinner. You can also indulge in a spa treatment in the full-service spa and salon on Deck 8. Now, Ricky and I both enjoyed a massage. I had the 60-minute Balinese massage, Ricky had the 60-minute hot stone massage, and both were very relaxing. We both felt very refreshed afterward. I think each massage was priced at about $180. Swanolinic provides guests with at least one included excursion in every port. Optional excursions are also available at an additional cost. We did book one optional excursion, a Panama Canal Rainforest small boat tour for $169 per person. And we felt like it was a very good value and it even included a little box lunch. Many of the excursions on our cruise involved zodiac landings on a beach, which means a wet landing. Now, zodiacs are these small, rigid, inflatable rubber boats that are used to shuttle guests to and from the ship to the shore where no docks are available. And these zodiacs usually carry 10 to 12 guests at a time. And during a wet landing, you can expect to exit the zodiac by stepping off the zodiac in up to 12 to 18 inches of water. Therefore, it's highly recommended that you pack water socks and clothes made from quick drying fabrics. You can put your shoes or sandals into the waterproof backpack provided by Swanolinic. Dry your feet once you're on the beach and then put your shoes on afterwards. Or you could wear waterproof hiking shoes. Of course, after 144 cruises, I figured I was smart enough to ignore the recommendations and I did not bring water socks or water shoes, a decision that I would regret after the first wet landing. The excursions provided by Swan Hellenic were all excellent. The expedition team members were very professional, very friendly, our expedition leader, Nikki D'Souza, is a real pro, and we've actually sailed with Nikki twice in the past, many years ago when we, she worked for Silver Sea Cruises. Expedition excursions are why you book an expedition cruise. Now, we've been on several different expedition cruises, and Swan Hellenic handles the Zodiac operations and the expeditions as well, if not better, than any of our other cruises. Our only negative observation about the excursions would be that on our walking tours, there were no quiet box receivers provided to guests, which made it very difficult to hear the tour guide speaking. Swan Olenek kept the group small with no more than 20 in each group. But if you fall behind, like I often do to take photos or video, you won't be hearing the commentary. And in Cartagena on the city tour, we would often be in noisy parts of the city with traffic or construction, making it nearly impossible to hear the tour guide. So my recommendation to Swan Hellenic would be to put a quiet Vox system in every stateroom for guests to use on tour.
This cruise was 10 nights embarking in Punta Arenas, Costa Rica and disembarking in Cartagena, Colombia. That meant SH Diana would have to transit the Panama Canal from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Make no mistake that this particular itinerary is not what SH Diana was designed and built for. She's a polar class vessel constructed with Antarctica and the Arctic in mind. That's where the real money is for expedition cruise lines. However, visiting these polar regions can only be done seasonally due to weather conditions and daylight. We knew going into this cruise that SH Diana was repositioning from her Antarctica season to the Arctic regions of Greenland, Iceland, and Norway. I am speculating that one of the reasons our sailing was at only 50% capacity was because expedition cruisers seek out Swan Hellenic primarily for visiting these polar regions. With that in mind, this was still a very good itinerary with some interesting ports and islands. For me personally, the highlight was transiting the Panama Canal. This was our fourth time to transit the canal, but the first time we have done so from west to east. A Panama Canal sailing should be on every cruiser's bucket list. And from personal experience, I can tell you that it is much more enjoyable aboard a small vessel like SH Diana. The ability to walk out to the swan's nest and get an up-close view of the locks on the canal was incredible. Another highlight for us was our very first stop in Capos, Costa Rica, where we visited the Kuru Wildlife Refuge. This was an included excursion, and it was excellent. We walked through the jungle, saw the monkeys, the sloths, deer, capybara, a few other creatures. I don't even remember their names. Very well done. Our stop at Chabaco Island gave guests an opportunity to spend some time on the beach. But the snorkeling was not very good here, or so we heard. We did not snorkel on this cruise, so I had to rely on what other guests told us. Even though the weather prevented us from making a zodiac landing to visit the Embera tribe on an island in Panama, Swan Olenek was able to bring the indigenous people to SH Diana, where they educated us about their culture, provided us with their traditional music and dance, and even brought their handmade baskets and jewelry to sell. Some of the guests even got a free tribal vegetable dye tattoo and Ricky was one of them. When SH Diana docked at Fuerte Amador, the port city for Panama City, we did have an opportunity to experience one of the optional excursions offered by Swan Hellenic. Our small boat tour of Panama Canal was well worth the $169 per person price for the five hour tour. We got to see crocodiles, Ricky even got to hold a baby croc. We saw more monkeys, various birds, and even some fruit bats clinging to a tree trunk. I've never seen that before. For those who love to snorkel, a morning at the San Blas Islands provided the clearest waters and the best snorkeling. We stayed on board that day because that morning, Ricky had tested positive for COVID and was quarantined. So I spent most of the morning moving my stuff to a different stateroom. Now, we've been to Cartagena more times than I can remember, and this was our final port of call. We overnighted here so guests could experience Cartagena. I took the included Cartagena city tour excursion, and it was one of the best included excursions of any cruise line that I can remember. They even stopped a couple of times for snacks and fresh fruit, which is almost a unheard of on an included excursion. Se encontraron a pesar de todo porque la vida lo quiso y así fue y juntos construyeron su castillo Pasaron años y la 
llama se fue apagando Se fueron olvidando Cómo ser dignos al amor Cada vez más alejados y callados So what is the Swan Hellenic experience? On our cruise, the demographics included guests from all over the world with ages that range from 30-somethings to folks in their 70s. The dress code is very casual throughout the day. Some even wore shorts to dinner in the evening. Personally, I would define the experience as moderate luxury. We even have a 75-point scale that we use to measure what we consider to be luxury. And SH Diana scored 49.5 on that scale, which is extremely high for an expedition cruise. Only one other expedition ship ranks higher. Of course, all of this is subjective. In summary, the ship is beautiful and for the perfect size for expedition cruising. The food was good. There is some room for improvement there. The staterooms and suites are large with tons of storage space and lots of amenities that you would typically only find on ultra-luxury cruise ships. And of course, the crew, the expedition team, and the senior staff were all amazing. The real question after all of this talk is, would we like to sail on Swan Atlantic again? And would we feel good about recommending it to others? The answer to both of those questions is decidedly yes. Now, if you have any questions regarding our cruise aboard SH Diana, please put them in the comment section below. We read every comment, and remember, if you enjoyed this video, please give it a big thumbs up because that really helps our YouTube channel to grow. And in case you're wondering, SH Diana was named for the goddess of light the moon, hunting, and the wilderness. Thank you for watching this video, and until next time, smooth sailing.